welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. <laughs> Humans. Dogs. Dogs <laughs> acting like humans. Humans acting like dogs. Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> How are you today, sir? Yeah, I'm doing great, Douglas. I'm actually uh, separating myself a little bit from my custom orders, and we're assuming again this week that we uh, do not have my customers <laughs> listening to the podcast. <laughs> I was thinking about that. I'm like, oh, you kind of like told one of your little behind the scenes business secrets there that yeah, I could no, get out. I did not. I, I did not. I have. Uh, <laughs> I have a really great clients that are being really understanding with um, all of my lies, <laughs> <laughs> which is oh, funny. Man. Like I typically never, ever, ever will send a piece out unless I've been paid. It's like one of the no nos on our business, yeah. right? Yeah, right. But I have been heaping on so many different pieces of bullshit to my customers that they're like, <laughs> "We're gonna, um, we're gonna pay you when we get it." And I'm like, <laughs> they're starting to see through it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. I get it. That's okay. I okay. get it this time. But um, <laughs> you know, typically, Douglas, we're recording in. Um, we, I don't know. We 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 typically record if we want to break down the third wall, like around mm -hmm. I don't know between like nine a.m. to eleven a.m. Sure, kind of yeah. thing. But mm -hmm. um, you are a glass blower. You and your wife, obviously, that the, the folks have learned. So you guys have to be. Oh, uh, I think we got heat stroke today, actually, because our oh. last piece. We were going to be finished right around 11, and if I'll be damned, if anyone watches Blown Away, you'll appreciate this. The piece fell off the pipe, broke in the oven. It's like, oh, I don't know if we were more heartbroken for all the work we put into it or the fact that we knew we were going to have to make another one in the hottest part of the day. But anyway. <laughs> did yes. you guys get to it? Did yeah. You do, did you make the... Yeah, we did. We got it made. It all worked out. Uh, we wanted to get in this particular color combination. Yeah. We wanted to get a nice showcase piece to take on to the next one. Awesome. Good for you. Good for, good for, for sticking with it. I actually am. Uh, I've been working kind of between the custom orders. I actually threw something up and I, I say threw it on the easel, but it actually is too big to fit on the easel. Oh, wow. Um, that is big. Yeah. How, how, how big really is it? big. It's nine feet wide, uh, six feet tall. And I'm using bigger brushes, kind of going a little bit more gestural and slightly abstract on it and, and having, uh, honestly, good good times in the studio. Uh, believe That's it or awesome. Not. <laughs> I know you'll find that hard to believe having uh, spoken to me earlier in the week. And you're like, <laughs> I didn't get throw up emoji. Throw up emoji usually means I'm too busy. <laughs> yeah. I think it was beyond throw up emoji. Yeah, is there an atom bomb? <laughs> <laughs> It's but, all um, good. <laughs> you know, we, we are recording at, uh, what, like 5.30, and, and that is officially... Ah, there we go. Bring I, it I don't on. typically there drink a podcast, folks, but here there. it goes. I deserve I deserve this beer. You should see this painting I'm working on, God damn it. <laughs> I was, um, when I was just a wee lad and just out of college, and, and I'd, I'd gotten a job at a frame shop, I was teasing the, the manager on the way out. I'm like... We're going out for lunch and having martinis. And the guy, he's not really a cursing kind of guy, but he goes, <laughs> he just goes, fuck it. We ain't cops. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's fuck it. Thing. We ain't cops. We ain't cops. So, right. Yeah, exactly. Podcasting ain't police work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, what's going on with you, sir? I am back from the set of The Walking Dead. Hmm. Well, that would be my last show. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It was not that bad. But anyone who does Ann Arbor knows that there are stretches where we've got those glazed over zombies walking by our booth. In fact, we're freaking glazed over zombies about yeah. at, by the time nine o'clock comes around. Was it uh, was it hot again there this year? It wasn't terrible. I mean, I'm a glass blower, of course, so I have a tolerance. <laughs> right. But it wasn't that hundred degree. It didn't even get to ninety. I don't think so. It was. It weather was. Was fine. No storms to run for. Nothing. Gotcha. Nothing like okay. that. But so uh, nice and easy. That's good. You're like it's. It ain't hot for me. I'm a glass blower. It might yeah. have been hot for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. If it's hot I, for me, it's hot. You'd for have been a running for the AC. But I, I will right. say the setup was pretty nasty. I did catch word that a number of folks got some pretty bad uh, heat heat reactions with setting up the day before the show. That was pretty awful. You got to watch yourself. I remember um, breaking down during uh, Lakefront. 
one year and mm. g- and trying to hurry because space is limited and it was 103 that day and I got completely overheated uh, during that show and yeah. was like I got really dizzy and I threw up. I mean, it was like, well, check, 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 you know, down the yeah. list of, of all the things that you need to watch out for. But and I don't know. I had, I had good friends looking out for me. I, I believe Mark Winter was checking in on me like, dude, <laughs> yeah, you, right, you're not, you, you sound kind of weird for you, even. <laughs> yeah, you're terrible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I have noticed at these shows, Ann Arbor included, with this new hyper contagious variant that's out there, I hear plenty of artists come home after their weekend show with COVID, just really? like Susie experienced after Denver. Yeah, yeah. She was, she's still kind of getting over it. She got a pretty nasty cough. So, mm. yeah, you know, I, we talked about last week or a couple weeks ago. If you are sick, just just doing the right thing and being responsible. But I mean, I do get it if it's not an option. Well, and I think it's the thing that kind of creeps up on you. You're like, I turned into a hypochondriac. I'm feeling my glands. I'm like taking my temperature. And then how many times you get negative until somebody tests positive? So it's kind of like it kind of creeps up on you. I was face to face with a good friend at Ann Arbor who didn't come on the last day of the show because it became very clear overnight he had it and didn't want to infect his friends. But I was face to face in his booth talking to him the day before. Feeling his glands. (laughs) I was not feeling his glands. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I hear you. I mean, he said it sounds like he did the right thing. And and, uh, I don't know. It's it's so hard. I don't know. We drive across the country. We put so much into this business. It's like, especially if you're cutting shows down, I'm like, I'm I'm doing like, you know, I'm only going to do seven shows this year. I'm like, yeah. Well, what happens if I get COVID like happened? You know, it, right. it's, it's really put me in a bind. And if one of those shows is one that you pretty much can rely on it being a good fat paycheck right. and you have to shut it down. Yeah. And I mean, I, I've cut the fat on my show schedule. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not doing any show that I'm not actually counting on anymore. Right, right. And that's that's huge, huge pressure. I don't want to get off the Ann Arbor topic before I give a shout out to Mo Riley, the the director of the show for 13 years. She's finally able to retire. She's been no trying way. to retire. She's been wow. trying to retire since right before COVID. But then when COVID happened, you know, she didn't just want to walk away and she yeah. wanted it to come back from COVID and have legs behind it. She wanted the artists to still have the kind of show they were used to. So she's seen it through until the new director who we got to meet this week, Angela Klein, is taking okay. over and it's going to be in capable hands with Angela. Nice. Well, I got to I got to say a special thank you to Mo, because I, I do think she's one of the best in the business and yeah. um, has definitely dealt with. A lot of challenges throughout her career as far as the the show has gone and and different things and hoops she's had to had to jump through and artists getting a keg at the booth and wait 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 wait, what am i missing here (laughs) (laughs) and why wasn't i invited (laughs) i didn't didn't know yet it was years ago it was oh you you no no i'm not naming names no i really think i could not think more highly of mo and and i've given ann arbor a load of of crap over the years but they can't control the weather and they no, can't control no. the construction and they can't control other shows glomming on to themselves but i think she's done a tremendous job yeah i agree and i will say it was nice meeting angela and finding out a little bit about her she actually has experience in the glass studio that's always nice for somebody like me to have somebody who knows a thing yeah. or two about my medium so yeah, what's her background? She's got a, a background in the arts and, and, and glass. And I mean, is she an, she's an artist herself. That I don't know, Mr. Armstrong. Yeah. <laughs> I just know that I'm she's... asking these probing questions. <laughs> All I know is she told me that she met her husband in a glass blowing class. And that was kind Perfect. of a sweet story. That is uh, really good sweet. enough for me. That's good enough. <laughs> yeah. But I do like that the, I've had the same conversation with. Camille Marchese from Coconut Grove. She is also in the process of taking a bunch of different art classes, different mediums, just so she kind of knows what her artists are doing. Heck yeah, so, good for her. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. Oh, my God. That reminds me. She actually sent me an email, and I've been so 
incredibly stupidly busy. I need to respond to that about her uh, emerging artist program oh, cool. down at the Grove. Hey, uh, Douglas, uh, speaking of Camille, let's welcome her since we are sponsored by the NAIA. Yes. She is uh, welcome to the board. Yes. How great is that? That is awesome to have another show director to give us that perspective on that side of the business. And and also want to say welcome to the board, Reiko Yucatel. Nice. She's joined so us cool. as well. And, I could not think you know, more highly of her. It's nice to have the youngins joining us, right? I yeah. have the youngins come <laughs> in. <Right? laughs> oh, man. It's uh, it's very cool to have, have a couple of uh, spark some life back into yeah. it. Um, sure. Looking at the board of the NAIA, you've got mm-hmm. you and me, a couple of artists. You got Ben Fry, Amy Landsberg, Diane French. Oh, and there's Evan, Evan Reinheimer. And uh, now we have Rako. Nice. And as far as directors go, we've got, what do you say, Cindy Doug? Lyric got... and Sharon Tanner and Camille Marchese, who's joining us this, this past month. Yeah. So nice to have the cogs and the wheels fitting in together and getting along and and, uh, trying to make things happen. So a part of our our point in mentioning, too, is these are people you can reach out to if you have any comments or concerns or anything going on with shows or ideas. These are some good people to to reach out to if you, you know. Not me, though. Not not Will. No, not (laughs) Will. I don't want to talk to these people. He's Good busy. Lord. He's got a lot on his plate. <laughs> I do. I don't want to talk to anybody. Well, speaking of the youngins, we were talking about Reiko joining the board. I had a really cool experience at Ann Arbor. I wanted to do a shout out here, and I, I hope uh, I hope she's listening. I hope Hannah Flower is out there listening right now, because apparently we have this listener who is an emerging artist. Nice. Who has been enjoying the show, and I ran into her at Ann Arbor. So that was kind of cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of work? Well, I've I've got a little bit of a story here. So I came to know about Hannah through social, through you know promoting stuff for the podcast and and seeing her imagery. She does two uh, D drawings, paintings, really cool work. And her last name is Flower. Does that ring a bell? Um, no. Verkina Flower, one of our former guests. Oh. Kina Crow was Verkina Flower. And this turns out Hannah is her niece. And she's in the Emerging Artist Program. And she (laughs) is getting out on the road herself. So I'm super excited to welcome her to the road, everyone. Take her under (laughs) your wing. I am too. And I don't mean to laugh. But I'm like, no, I don't remember. Who do we talk? That's Kina. Kina who? I don't know what you're talking about. Kina who? (laughs) I don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> I'm exhausting. <laughs> oh, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> I feel like Douglas is there, like checking out every so... listener, and he knows exactly. He's like, "Well, I'm getting the ISP address pinged from here, so I'm pretty sure that that's Matthew Hatala that's listening ha, over there, and I'm ha, pretty sure we've got." Brad okay, Steve. okay, I resemble right. that remark, but no, that is not me. <laughs> I am not a Facebook stalker. Like, I don't see any listens coming out of the <laughs> Richville slash. Main area of Minnesota. I think he's not listening. Otter Tail County is very strong, by the way. I will. I will point mm. that one out. Excellent. Yes. Uh, loud and proud in Otter Tail County. <laughs> oh man. Okay. I know. Okay. I'm not going to get into the sentimental. Oh, my poor aching feet. I'm str- I'm struggling. I mean, I know that's been a, a common. Dude, you're, yeah, you can go ahead. Oh, for Christ's sake. I know yeah, I've I earned s- it, but I'm sick of it. Yeah, you have. But I do have a kind of a funny story uh, related to this whole uh, injury because I know people who see me out there, they do realize it's kind of like the snowball rolling downhill. It's I'm looking a lot more crippled as, as the summer mm. goes on. But I am in the bathroom at Ann Arbor, a place where we kind of like to be alone with our thoughts and not have conversations. Sure. I'm an an alone guy in the bathroom. Um, But, you know, you're standing side by side with someone. You kind of just don't want to be talking about shit. I don't anyway. I'm not that. No, I'm not a talker. Okay. So this guy steps up next to me at the urinal and says, what the hell did you do? Uh. Ugh. I drank a lot of water, and then I have to Oh, pee. there, he's talking please. about that. He's talking about my feet. Right. I, I know, should have I said that. I wish I was as quick as you like that. 
<laughs> but, but, and I do appreciate all of the kind people who genuinely ask me, who know me, who want to know if I'm okay. That is, I, uh, I embrace that and I appreciate that uh, at all times. But this situation was somebody I didn't know. So I'm standing there staring at the wall because I don't want to turn my head. And I say, I was born this way. Oh my God. I just made it weird. Uh, I made it even more yeah. weird. You know what? You didn't make it weird. Somebody was talking to you while you literally had your junk in exactly. your Exactly. That, that's on him. That, he's the guy that made it weird. Well, then it gets worse. He gets really upset. And you're like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, man. I'm I'm. Oh, I'm real sorry. I just, I'm... Now I'm in a position where I have to console ah, and make him feel never, better. Yeah. No, right. no, 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 no. It's okay. It's it's really it's it's it's. I'm gonna be fine. I got surgery scheduled. It's all good. It's all. It's. Can we just stop talking now? <laughs> oh my god. That's so awkward. Like, uh, let me walk in your shoes for a while. I'll, I'll talk to him, Doug. Let me go talk to him. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Oh my god! So that was that All was right. a, a fun experience. Yeah, it was fun. It was <laughs> delight. Bless your heart. Did you have to give him a little hug there? Did you? No. Did you no, hug him? Well, no, no hugging. No touching was involved. He, he went his <laughs> way, and we were done. All right. Thanks. I don't know. It, it seems like you you say something to the customers out there, and they're like, they want to talk about uh, one thing that that takes you out of your game, yeah. and so you try to make light of it, but then you get these guys that are like. No, I'm going to stick with this. Tell me exactly what's up. And then they're going to just keep hammering gonna, it home yeah. until, you, until you have to confront it. And, you know, there was a topic on Facebook earlier where people were, I'm trying to remember the name of the person that, that chimed in to one of our posts on uh, our group page, but they were they were talking about getting confrontational. Oh, yeah. Dan, I, Dan Bondroff uh, jumped in and was talking yes. about, yeah about what basically what we said about don't make small talk with a volatile, with a volatile stranger. stranger that's what the word yeah okay yeah. but go ahead with your story on that yeah well no i just wanted to bring that up because i'm i mean like i talk a big game but i really don't i don't want to ever get confrontational with people right. because it really does throw me off my game and it's like i may not be here to talk to the person who is interrupting me but if i really engage with them talk politics talk this or that that i it's going to throw me off my game for i don't know how long it's going to take it may take a couple mm -hmm. of hours and i don't have a couple of hours right. when you look at these art shows it's like okay we are a retail store that's only open however many shows that you can do anyway. right so whether it's five or 35 that's a retail store that that's only mm -hmm. open it's you crazy. Know, 15 Why do we do that? Out of the years. <laughs> it's a crazy business model. So you cannot afford to engage these jackholes that want to talk about things that are, that are going to upset you or throw you off the game. So we have to develop this this very thick skin. And the spark. We don't want to miss the spark with people who are interested because we're still wrapped up into what just happened or that whatever that conversation was made people not want to stay and engage in the work. Right. So we right. can we have lost opportunities. So so you visualize Paul Lynn yeah. or you do whatever it takes to just to harken back to an earlier episode yeah. and and my buddy Tim Hooper. There you go. Um you know, you can't be in a bad mood if you do certain things. So, you know, do whatever it takes to to bring yourself back. Well, you know what's point. worked for me Don't is me. your own words. Uh, I don't remember how many episodes ago it was, but we were in Fort Worth and you talked about the kids who came in your booth. You yeah. know, you enjoyed that interaction. You wanted to be that mentor for them. But a way to transition to somebody who was ready to buy something was very clear. Yes. And now I use those same techniques with everybody. I'll say, well, thank you for coming. It was so nice to see you. And the conversation the, is over. It's, it bookmarks it. And I've, you know what? And I've had people do that to me. And I'm like, they're doing it to me. That's good. Oh, good. I'm glad they said that to me because then I could get with the program and get the fuck out of their booth. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? And my work here is not done. There folks. you go. We're, we're still having artists coming in and interrupting other artists while they're trying to eat. I got a text Shut from, uh, from Ty. I thought yeah, that art, did it. I he, thought that stuck a big no. fat fork in it. No, they, he. I got a picture from Ty oh, over the weekend no. of him sitting in a chair, his little folding chair, with a salad half into his mouth, while this other artist is like blabbing and just running their mouth. It's like, 
Do not talk to another artist while they are trying to eat. If I have one thing I'm going to get across to you <laughs> lovely, lovely humans, uh, it is a do not interrupt another artist while they're trying to eat. We only get a couple of minutes. And I'm, I'm like, God, if I don't waste my chewing time. On ch- <sighs> shooting the shit. That's going to be our Facebook meme of the week. That's what that's going to go up on the board. <laughs> mm. No one's ever going to come talk to me again. <laughs> He always tell me these great stories about these other artists. They're coming in. We're like, oh, I talked to this person. They're like, like, like scared to come talk. Oh, to you're me. gonna be flooded. <laughs> hey, so another thing I saw on social media. This is the the news reporting here uh, that other artists mm. were going through. It, it's bad news, but it, there's there's a good information at the end of it. Did you see about the Aspen flood that happened a, a couple no. weekends ago? Uh-uh. Oh, so nothing really was predicted. Flooded bunch of damage. I talked to Sharon Spiller about it. She lost a ton of paintings in that flood. Really? Yes. I did not see that at all. She's a good friend. I'm, I'm sorry to hear yeah. that. Good Lord. And she also told me some information that would be good for all of us to know with our insurance plans. She's pregnant? Is she? I'm just kidding. No, she's she's like 50 this sounds like an inside joke you got going here. I'm just she's fucking probably... with her. I love Sharon. She's great. She's pregnant with cats. That's what she's going to have a litter of cats. <laughs> no, that's All that right. wasn't the the good news. She no, that wasn't the it's news true. she told me. What it's she true. told me was if you have flood damage in your booth and you report it to your insurance company, there was a flood that came in here and knocked out a bunch of my work. The word flood is a bad word. Wow. Don't use the word flood. You need a special okay. writer or some special. Those are things that are written out of all insurance deals. You could leave your flap open in the rain, got all your work ruined. My flap is open right now. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> hey, yo. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, so what do you say? So you say I had water damage. Huh. Yep. But by calling it a flood, it's a whole different deal. So this is our uh, word of wisdom out there to all the artists. Uh, don't say, oh, did I say flood? I meant it was a smud. This is, this, I don't know that this is great advice to Douglas. It sounds like insurance fraud. Oh, shit. The opinions expressed on this podcast are not of the hosts <laughs> or of the sponsors. Do what you want. They're not even of the host. <laughs> of the host. It's not even okay. It's all Sharon's fault. All right, it's all on it's you. Spiller is what he's trying to say. You do anything that we said to do. It's this is this is for entertainment, not for your own. Are you entertained? Knowledge. <laughs> are, you, are we not entertained? <laughs> are we not? Yeah. No. All right. <laughs> yeah. No. No, we're not. Come on, Will. We have got to clean up our act here. Uh, This crude conversation is not the proper introduction to our guest, Patricia. anything crude. Really? You said your flap was open. No. That was crude. No. It was a... It's a euphemism. If you took it crudely, that's on you. All right, all right, all, all right. right. So I love the fact that you're interviewing Patricia. Um, it's a really great talk, and we can Thanks. we can kick right into this thing. I just I've always felt really highly about her, and I've talked to Ray, her husband, yeah. and, and we're gonna kick it down the down the line a little bit, and and I'm gonna interview him too, and kind of get his take too. I've always looked to him as kind of a as a beacon of like how to do this this business so uh it'll be really interesting to get both sides patricia's spirituality that you guys are getting ready to hear and yeah uh when i i talk to ray here in a few weeks as well i'm just excited for you guys to to hear from this amazing human yeah that's really cool i i loved talking with her and i really did not know that i was going to be accessing the deep catholic traumas that were unearthed and healed in the course of this conversation. I went Episcopalian. That's that's like Catholic light. Really like half the guilt and uh, not really any of the touching. <laughs> you know, without any further ado okay. and sexual okay. innuendo, we have a lovely talk with an incredibly generous, spiritual human. And I, I can't wait for you guys to hear this. Great talk, Douglas. Let's, let's roll All it. All right. Here is Patricia DeLeon from Greenville, South Carolina. This episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap. 
the digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. I see here there are some new features with the events list category through Zap, which will help us with looking up new shows to fill a spot in our schedule. You know, I feel like I should have something to say, but I wasn't really listening to you because I'm looking at the events list right now and it's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so you drop the menu down and there at the bottom, go scrolling all the way, about third thing down in the smaller print, it just says events list. That's right. All of the shows appear here regardless of their application deadline. You can use filtering and sorting to narrow down your search to find the right show that fills your desired time frame or location. I know a lot of people love that calendar. I like seeing the list of events. I like scrolling through and doom scrolling late at night. <laughs> it's like online dating. They don't let you swipe left or right, but you can figure out who you want to date coming up here. Patricia, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much. This is our first meeting. It <laughs> this is. is kind of I'm a little nervous. I don't know you that well. <laughs> I know. We're going to discover each other in the next conversation. That's right. Over our screens. Yeah. How do I say your last name? Is it De Leon? You got it. Okay. So Patricia De Leon, where, where are you at right now? Where am, I, where am I seeing you? I'm in my office in my home in Greenville, South Carolina. Green, Greenville. And how long have you guys been there? We've been here about five years and... Mm -hmm. If we had known each other for a longer span, you might have known that we've lived all over the country, including like Chattanooga, Seattle, Miami, and now we have officially put down roots and we are married to Greenville, South Carolina. Okay, so this feels like uh, this is going to be a while here, huh? I, I'm saying yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I did notice when I was looking over your website, I saw that's a big part of your story is that you guys have set up roots in a lot of different places throughout the country over the years. So we're both immigrants, Ray and I. Mm -hmm. And okay. so that comes with a sort of rootlessness, which is positive in a way. And we both have chosen not to have kids. So that mm -hmm. allows you to come and go as you please. And we're self-employed artists. So when we put that all of that together, it's meant a really wonderful experience of just kind of traveling, doing art shows, and then falling in love with the city, finding a building, committing to it, and just having all of these wonderful experiences all over the country. So it, it never felt too foreign or uncomfortable for you to say, you know what, we're, we're kind of done here. Let's try out this part of the country or, or set up a place somewhere else. I think that is what happens. We've often been on a seven-year cycle. Okay. So at the end, when we're coming upon our fifth year, which we are right now. Oh. <laughs> is that where the itch starts to come in? This is when the itch starts. <laughs> and it actually happened to us when we were driving to Cherry Creek, and we both looked at each other and said, like, let's not get caught up. This is, we love where we are. Let's, let's not do this again. Okay. Yeah. You were kind of shutting down that uh, yes. <laughs> wanderlust. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. It's just, it's a magic that happens, I think, when we're in the van and we just have, mm. you know, you just are faced with all of this freedom, all of these opportunities. And we rarely even listen to music. We talk almost nonstop when we're in the van. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's interesting. I talked yeah. to somebody else on the road recently, husband, wife, artist team, and said they don't listen to music or whatever, that the conversation can go on and on through that long drive. That's really cool. Yeah, it is definitely the case with us. Mm -hmm. We'll have little, you know, little breaks for some music or like NPR or, you know, a rare podcast, but it's mainly mm -hmm. conversation. Sweet. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned Denver because... When I looked last night as to where you were born and, and where you got this, your start in life, where was that again? What, what's the name of the city in Venezuela you're from? Caracas. Caracas. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, and, and it's the Andes Mountains right off in the, on the distance or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it felt like Denver. Ah, it is a city. It's a mountainous city. However, I never experienced a lot of nature when I was there. Oh. My parents were never really into nature. So I mm. came to experience nature and like learned how to ride a bike and do all the things when we moved to the U.S. That is a huge part of your spirituality and a huge part of your art is mm -hmm. that, that sense of nature, what you're describing here. Is that true? I think it is. And I think growing up in an apartment... In a big mm -hmm. city, Caracas is a city of almost 3 million people. 
And I was raised by two people who are not outdoors people, which is very interesting okay. um, for somebody who loves nature. Mm -hmm. So I think it it prompted me to develop a very a very pronounced interior life and just kind mm -hmm. of to imagine all of those things. Early on. Early, Early on. on, it was all in your imagination, mm -hmm. though. We lived in a big apartment building. We lived on the 10th floor. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a day when we had the windows open. That is my first experience with an animal, which is a little parakeet flew in our window. Oh. And that was like the beginning of my connection with birds is like this little parakeet became my first, my first pet. Oh. And the same thing with like moths and all sorts of like nocturnal, like flying insects that would come in the window sometimes. Yeah. And I believe that's kind of where my, my love of nature and also viewing the natural world as companions and symbols. Interesting. So that was your first experience with that. And, and kind of like your, it's a foreign environment. So it was like this magical kind of life for you to have that exposure to that. Absolutely. And it wasn't until I was eight and we moved to the U.S. And then that's when I learned how to ride a bike and I learned how to swim and learned how to do all of the things. Mm -hmm. And until then, I hadn't really experienced very many of those things. That's cool. Um, well, my question earlier about all of the different traveling and the, and the setting up home in different parts of the world, it kind of was in my mind setting me up for what interests me about the talk that I wanted to have with you today, and that was this intense spiritual and physical journey that you just got back from. I got exposed to what you were doing online, and I've always wanted to talk to somebody who experiences an El Camino walk. Can you tell me about that? I'd love to. I'd love to. So it's something that I learned about the Camino de Santiago is the full name of it. And okay. it's simply the a Camino is a path. Santiago is the Spanish uh, name for St. James and Compostela. If you talk about the whole, the whole experience is a, is a field of stars. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a beautiful ancient pilgrimage route. It's actually a network of ancient pilgrimage routes that culminate in Northwest Spain in a cathedral in Santiago de Compostela. Okay. So having grown up Catholic, there was a lot of mention of it growing up. And then when I was probably in my early 30s and I started doing art shows, I met Duke Klassen, oh, yeah. another art show artist. Yeah. And he, he and I had some great conversations about it. And he was the first person that I actually knew that had walked the Camino. Okay. So this is a Christian pilgrimage. I did not know that. Traditionally, it is a, it's a Catholic pilgrimage. What's the history behind it? Are people like trying to escape persecution or something? What is it about? They are escaping their sins, if you want to look at it this way. Um, I see. Okay. The traversing of this pilgrimage and reaching the church in, in Santiago de Compostela offers you a plenary indulgence is what it's called. And yeah. it is, it's sort of like buying your way out of some of your sins. So oh. traditionally, this is why pe people did pilgrimages okay. or part of the reason. And now it's grown to be something which is a spiritual walk. It's a spiritual quest. And mm -hmm. the people that do it now are from all walks of life. A lot of them are not religious people. And mm -hmm. some of them are. I see. I, I grew up Catholic uh, un, until my 20s, I'd say, when I I saw the light. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know. I saw the light, too. <laughs> but so I had no idea that it was – it was so it's kind of like a penance. It's um, an absolution of your sins. It's an absolution of your sins. It's a, it's a way to, um, to, to reach it's, – it's a sort of way of like buying your way out of it. Okay. Yeah, no, I remember saying 10 Hail Marys, and that was the penance. So, yes. I mean, was this supposed to be over like a lifetime of, was this designed for people who had not behaved the best, and this was their, their way out of it, or just it was just a spiritual walk back then? It's a, it was a spiritual walk, and it was, it was taken on by people as diverse as like kings and queens and peasants. Okay. So, it was not for 
it wasn't meant for a sinner, so to speak, okay. but um, right. it was definitely a place where you would take on this personal challenge and offer it as an offering. Offering. It must be an extreme physical challenge, right? So how, how long of a pilgrimage is it? Well, so the Camino de Santiago is a network. So it's basically you can begin in places in Portugal, you can begin in France, you can begin in places all over Europe, okay. as you would have done in the Middle Ages if you would have taken this on. You would have walked out your door in you know Germany or in Spain, and you would have just gotten on this path, and it would have led you to Santiago, which is the northwest corner of Spain. I took on a two-week walk which began in Porto, Portugal. Okay. A lot of other people begin in the mountains of France, and that's about a 35-day walk. And that's oh. one, that's a walk that I want to have in the future. So did you pick that entry point based on the physical aspect of it? Like you felt like I could I could handle a two-weeker? or Exactly. What were you th- yeah. Right. And then now that you've you've been through that and you had that experience, you're like, I really want to challenge myself to more? Oh, absolutely. And there's something kind of addictive about it. Really? I am interested in doing, probably over my lifetime, I can visualize myself walking all of them. And oh. it's something, it's just, it's a wonderful way to, it's like intentional travel. Sure. Where you're a bit outside of time. Mm-hmm. And it's just a really beautiful and intense experience. And is it a real reflective period of of? deep contemplation about life and what's going on and that sort of thing? or It can be. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it was for me. And then there's other times when you are walking and you are completely absorbed in nature, not even thinking. And then other times when you are having great conversations with people from all over the planet. So uh, there's a huge social aspect to it. And there's a lot of people who go for that reason. And then there's people who you see will walk by you and you know that they're not interested in talking at all. And so I everybody see. kind of respects each other and reads each other's like body language, basically. So it's really tailor-made to what you personally want to get out of the experience, it sounds like. Absolutely. A lot of people do it by themselves. A lot of cancer survivors mm. kind of in the midst of self-examination, making big decisions in life, people looking for a personal challenge. And sometimes people traveling in groups and oftentimes people traveling by themselves. Mm -hmm. I met a lot of people who were big, jolly groups of people. And then I saw, let's say, this group of wonderful people from Spain walking together. They were like uber social and I had a couple of great meals with them. And then on the last day of our walk, they were walking by themselves. So everybody had kind of like come apart. Everybody was walking by themselves and they were basically saying, like, this is the day we go inward. Mm-hmm. We're not really socializing today. And I that, gotcha. it, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. So, right. So, like, yesterday, these folks might have been people you guys, you know, could really have a good conversation with, but the next day, they might have a more solemn thing about them, and you all read each other's... Exactly. S- ...where they're at. Exactly. And yeah. you might not know from day to day where you where you are. Like, you might wake up that day and feel a deep sense of reverence or something that just needs to be personal and introspective. Completely. And everybody just kind of respects it. Your energy ebbs and flows as well. So Mm. some days you might be, you know, kind of like leading the pack of the people that you're walking with. And then Mm -hmm. the next day you are completely depleted. And so you're, you're not walking that fast. And all of those changes in energy, I think, provide you with the experience that you're going to have. And some mm. of it is by choice. In other instances, you're just going with the amount of energy that you have because it's you're you're extremely exhausted every day. And does the group move in the same kind of benchmarks? Like, let's say, I don't know, I don't know how long would you put in in, in a leg a day? Fifteen to twenty. Fifteen to let's say an average of fifteen miles a day. And I okay. walked for um, twelve days. I took one day of rest. Mm. So basically, I began in Porto. There was a few of the people that I left that day with Mm -hmm. that I saw along the way. And some of them I got to know, some of them I didn't. And sometimes you would start talking with someone or notice somebody and then you would never see them again. Mm -hmm. So it just means 
there's different you know, paces going a number, on. A number of things could have happened. Maybe they took a different rest day or maybe they had to give up. Mm-hmm. I invited my good friend from Chattanooga, my friend Jesse. Okay. And so we were walking together. Basically, the two of us were walking and we would let our energy for the day just kind of mark the amount of miles we wanted to do. I had made all of our reservations in advance. So we knew that we had to cover a certain amount of mileage every day to get to where we were going to sleep. (laughs) That sounds kind of like our show artists too, right? (laughs) Yes. You've got to get to Des Moines before, you know, Thursday at 8 a.m. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was wondering what kind of like travel component there was to that. Like, do you book reservations for hotels or are you stopping where you stop or do you tent? I wasn't even sure if this was like people stay out along the way. I don't know. A lot of people sleep in these communal spaces called refugios. And Mm. it's basically like that's the traditional pilgrim's way to travel. And it could be, let's say, for example, a monastery, which is open to pilgrims. And they just have all of these bunks. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, five euros, they will let you sleep there. There's a very rustic, you know, shower and there's a meal. Mm -hmm. Then there's a lot of people who camp. There's people who book hotels We Mm -hmm. tried to do a a combination of of everything. Mm -hmm. We didn't camp because we didn't want to carry the equipment, Mm -hmm. but I kind of designed it so that it would provide a a variety of different experiences for us. I guess I understand now that the kind of the technical and the physical aspect of of this journey, but then it sounds to me that a huge component is that introspective part of it, you know, so everybody at some point on their journey probably is having reflections that are deep and in, into their soul, into their life, into whatever, whatever's going on. Do you feel that kind of that communal sense amongst the people? Like, is there kind of a, a reverence or a heaviness about that? Um, I don't know if there's a heaviness, but I feel like there is a reverence for the experience. Mm-hmm. You all have the same intention of walking this for whatever purpose, Mm -hmm. you have the same end point, you're going to reach that cathedral at the end of your walk. Mm -hmm. So it's a shared purpose. And I think there is often a desire to reconnect with yourself to reconnect with the natural world. Mm -hmm. And I think most everybody is looking to deepen their experience and like, reach a replenishment of the soul. And what got you interested in this? I know you talked to Duke about it, but what when he told you about it and other experiences or thoughts about it, what made you think this was for you? I just intuitively always knew I wanted to do it, and mm. I can't explain where it is. I mean, when you read Joseph Campbell and he talks about a pilgrimage, he talks about the calling to the pilgrim, Okay, and that is... I can't really explain it. It's just kind of like I I learned about it. It was something that I've always wanted to do since I learned about it. It was just a knowing. It settled in and it was just like a no Absolutely. need to even question it or analyze it right. intellectually. There was a, a place inside of you that it just was like, yeah, that's for me. Absolutely. So the nature component, you say that you are a nature person. Um, you're surrounded in nature for this walk. Were there any discoveries along the way that just like that came out of it that you were just like, wow, you come out of it just having such a huge gratitude to your body for being able oh. to do it. Gotcha. And, and really, I think for me, the walk was an offering of gratitude. I just turned 50. I am so grateful to have had the life I've had to have the lifestyle I have, to make art for a living. Mm -hmm. And so day to day, you just feel at the end of the day, especially you just feel such a reverence and such a a gratitude for your body that it can take you carrying everything you need for 15 miles that day. I guess I didn't think about that aspect. You're carrying a pack Mm -hmm. with you of what you're going to need for the however many days you're on it. So that's part of your physical challenge is having it all on your back. You have it all on your back and I trained for it. You know, I had the shoes, my shoes were worn in. I had a pack and I walked around Greenville, which, you know, it's got some good hills. I did a lot of hiking, but nothing really prepared me for the terrain. It was, especially in Portugal, there's a lot of uneven terrain. So you're constantly walking on cobblestones Mm -hmm. and it's rainy, it's slippery. 
there are some mountains on it. And so nothing really prepares you until you're on it, basically. Yeah, because it's not like <laughs> it's not like you're walking on a on streets that have been paved for you, bike paths. It's probably narrow walking paths up and down, in and out of little towns. Is that is that pretty much accurate? Exactly. And there is an aspect of it which is not what we all picture, which is there are times when you're walking in, in heavy traffic. So you're walking through these old little towns mm. on a pretty, pretty tiny little lanes and you have traffic going by you. Mm -hmm. So that is probably the most dangerous aspect. You know, a lot of people think like, oh, you're a woman, you're out there walking by yourself. That's, that's a danger. But really, it's I believe it's the times that you are walking in the proximity of traffic that are the most dangerous, but overall it's minimal. You chose to bring a friend so the two of you could experience it together. Was that because of similar interest or was it coming down to that safety issue that you just felt maybe a little bit more protected if you had had a buddy? I mean, she's she's my soul sister. We just mm. have a great connection. She came at it from a completely different angle. For her, it was the desire to travel and to have this experience with me. And I believe that's what it was for both of us. It's just, I don't, I don't think she had that spiritual aspect to it, but I feel like she found it anyway. Gotcha. Yeah. That wasn't her, her reason in, right. but it settled into her anyway. It found its way in that way. Yeah. I think there's such a, there's such a huge aspect of it as a time to reconnect with yourself and to remember things that you had forgotten about yourself because you have, in her case, she is a very busy professional. She's a mother. Mm. I think sometimes life, you know, takes us from, from who we are. Right. The busyness, the technology, mm -hmm. all of that stuff gets us away from kind of the core, the natural world, the simple things. <laughs> you know what I mean? We can just, the, yeah. just this little, this little screen that we have that we've, devoted our eyes to so many hours of the day. Absolutely. Um, it can just like pull us away from from that spiritual center that you're talking about. Yeah, I think even just uh, being in the landscape for so many hours a day, and it, that's such a beautiful metaphor for mm. interior states. There was very minimal technology on my walk. A lot of people probably use it a little bit more. I chose to have it be a very minimal part. I would check email maybe like once a day. I mm -hmm. might look at a map, you know, once or twice a day, but I really wanted to keep that at bay for the keep walk. You, keep your mind clear. That clutter will be waiting for you when you get home. So completely. That was just a solace, a, a time away. Right. You said your your friend didn't come to it from a spiritual intention. But does that mean you did come to it with that that component? Was that something you were Oh, you yes. were looking. Can you tell me a right. little bit about that? Spirituality is something that defies words for me. Sure. But I think it's something that having been raised Catholic is such a huge aspect of my interior world. Because of the rigidity? I mean, with, with Catholicism, how there's right and wrong, there's there's clear black and white in a lot of issues. I mean, that that's what resonates for me personally. That's what my challenges were with Catholicism. Right. And that's what my challenges were. What I've always tried to remember is how it's enriched my life. I mean, I really feel like it formed my my love of images, my love of symbols, mm. and my love and understanding of, of mystery. I feel like I grew up going to a building, for example, when we lived in Miami, mm -hmm. we went to a Catholic church and the patron saint was St. Agatha. Mm -hmm. It's a woman who is holding her breasts on a plate. Okay. And so Catholicism is just full of all of these fascinating, like strange and mysterious symbols. And I feel like it really formed my my visual world. Like the art from the churches is what oh. kind of sparked that initial connection? Oh, yes. Absolutely. I don't, did you feel that way? I mean, a lot of the times... I was completely in a dream world when I was in church. I was not really interested in what was being said, but I was taking in the whole mm -hmm. like visual landscape of it. That's a good point. I, I hadn't thought of that. 
I did spend a lot of time. Our, our church <laughs> was, yeah. Uh, well, our church was one of those churches that had the frescoes all up and down, up the domes, all around. And then, I don't know, maybe the mid 80s, they painted over a lot of them and just kept some. So it was, became a little more of a contemporary space. But before hmm. that, yeah, I was looking up at, you know, a lot of like the Michelangelo type paintings that they replicated in our little church in Dubuque, Iowa. And the statues and, yeah, all of those images, definitely. And they're so dramatic and they're so strange. They are you know, strange. It's like these figures being impaled and these figures being impressed upon by other realms. You know, it's like saints with little flames coming out of their heads. And I always just thought that was so fascinating. And so this is how I started to understand the absolute truth of life is like I learned my way to absolute truths through symbols and images. Uh, that, I'm letting that sink in. So does it kind of come back to that, like when I asked you about how did you know you wanted to do the Camino Walk? It wasn't anything intellectual. It was something that settled in. So are you saying that these images and these symbols taught you not intellectually, but internally Completely. how to feel, to feel what feels right and to feel what doesn't feel right? Right. Even though, ironically, the church is then telling you a lot of that is wrong. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I think I constructed my own roadmap through mm. that, just kind of accepting what I felt was right and like taking in the, the beauty of the symbols and the mystery. And that is the reason why I can kind of look back on my Catholic heritage and, and feel positive about it, even okay. though I'm not Catholic anymore. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of Catholics that go running, kicking and screaming from that. Right. And you are taking the positive that came out of that experience and celebrating it and honoring it and using it in your current life. Yeah, I think it was a nourishment. And I think there's a lot of things that I've had to unlearn. But mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of beautiful things that I feel like are part of me. And like you said, it's almost like an intuition. Mm -hmm. I feel like it fueled my intuition. I, I can tell on a deep level you've healed that because even to re refer to that time as a nourishment, that's an honoring of that, that you not only did you survive it, you got something out <laughs> of it that, you know what I mean? It's it's yeah, on a, yeah, such a absolutely. subtle level. You are completely, you're helping me actually. <laughs> yeah. so I need to glad. go back to those times that I need to, to re reanalyze and, and do a little check-in and see where I can find the good out of it because... You know, I just I, I did see a lot of the bad, a lot of mm -hmm. the not allowing people to be who they truly are. I came out of that period feeling like you hate so many people for just being who they are and showing love. And right. And that just kind of like flipped a switch for me where I couldn't honor anything else because all I could see was the black and white thinking. I feel like I felt that way for so many years, and I, I was so angry about it for so many years. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've, it's, I've really come full circle. I'm not comfortable with the whole dogma, what, what, what people are supposed to believe within it. I don't believe it at all. Yeah. But I think I've found my way to like the space around all of the things that I learned through it and, and now able to say some of them did make me who I am. Mm -hmm. Nice. Would you say that you currently follow a like a named religion or do you have kind of your own very personal spiritual religion? I have never sought out religion after kind of leaving that behind. Mm -hmm. I would say I'm always on a spiritual quest. I'm always reading and talking with people. And I feel like there's just so much to be learned in that way. Mm -hmm. I love reading about Buddhism. I feel like it's just such a fascinating tradition. That's the closest thing. If I were to have to put my religious or spiritual eggs in a basket, that might be the one that it would be. Well, and what I appreciate most, and I agree with you, I feel like it's such a good instructional philosophy on how to live, how to breathe, how to, how to walk through life. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of other religions are just telling you, this is the way you should feel. And this is the way you should 
look at the world and treat a certain amount of people or a certain aspect of people, Mm -hmm. I feel like Buddhism teaches you so much more beyond that. Mm -hmm. So I have a great appreciation for it. Yeah, me too. Well, I just finished, and it's going to air tomorrow, my episode with Michelle Delgado. Fabulous. And he also works in a very similar spiritual type way. So I feel like I have found my way into this ebb and flow with the podcast, where this is a real deep interest to me. I feel like I am a spiritual person. Mm -hmm. And us as artists, as who we are, how we express ourselves, but then also how we make our living, that spirituality, we can't divorce that from it. It, It's not a separate thing. It's deeply rooted into the things we make and the things we want to put our attention into, would you say? We often sit or stand in rooms in solitude for upwards of 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day. And I think it's just such a beautiful space for filling it with whatever intention you want. And it can be music, it can be words. And I like to kind of like ride a little wave of silence and music and words when I'm in my studio for all of those hours. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just think it's, I think we're just the most fortunate people on the planet in that way. Well, what motivates what you create? What fuels the imagery? What fuels the process? What about that helps you as an artist? You know, I think maybe for about the first 10 or 15 years of my practice, Mm -hmm. I worked with the human figure. Mm. I started off as an encaustic painter self-taught encaustic painter. And so I used a lot of symbols and represented a lot of these ideas in people and animals, a lot of spirit animals with people. Okay. And then during 2020, it changed. Okay. I became completely removed from the figure and I was drawn to, I felt almost called to represent the experience we were all having in a way that would represent us more fully through more abstracted symbols. So kind of like removing the figure from it. Prior to the pandemic, you're saying figurative work was what you were called to make. Absolutely. And what was it about that? Was it trying to capture somebody's soul or their spirit or their experience? What about that was, was calling you? I really don't know. I think it's always been an intuitive attraction to the figure. And I think it'll always be there. And I'm sure I will come back to it from time to time. I have a feeling it it comes from the same conversation we've had of, Mm -hmm. of having grown up with the spirit world being represented through figures and religious art. Mm. I think that might be it. And then the shift happened. And then COVID happened and everything was turned on its head and you found yourself more connected to to imagery that was not human. Right. Edits, and right? Like nature or what, what were the symbols? It started off with the lotus flower, representing the experience that we were collectively having of transformation, of resilience in this lotus symbol. Mm. And then after that, I started having this kind of vision of representing us all as stacked bowls which I came to call it spirit bowls. That's a series that I've been working in probably for the past two and a half years. I just think it's such a powerful symbol, a way of representing our society, the way we hold each other up, the way that we nourish each other. I've really loved just working with that symbol. I love it too. It also has this feeling of that it's it's like we all have each other's back. We're all stacked, but there is that It's like a tenuous situation where they could all come tumbling down. Yes. These bowls are teetering oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of tension in them. You're right. And you're a vessel maker. You know about tension in vessels that have the potential to nourish each other, but they also have the potential to be shattered at any moment. I love that image. I love that that concept that, that, you know, what comes to mind like that. That's, um, That's beautiful. Thank you. Another thing that that I read about you is how important atmosphere has always been to your creative space throughout throughout your different studios. Can you talk about that? I feel like that is one of the most wonderful aspects of the life that we build as artists is creating this 
almost a sacred space where we create, where we are completely at ease. Mm -hmm. My first studio was an old garage that was behind our building in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. And we remodeled it. It became like the first space that had ever been mine. And since then, I've just made a plan to just, no matter how big it is or how small it is, how humble, just to fill it with things that delight me, whether they just be everyday objects, they could be sacred objects. I think that's just such a, again, feeling such a gratitude for being able to walk into that room and have that time there. I have an appreciation for what you're describing. I also have an appreciation for it being different than, say, what I do. As a glass blower, I do need a space that I can create, but it's definitely less of a sanctuary sanctuary it's less of a calm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> zone right. where you're alone with your thoughts and you're like let's say you know settling in it is about like it's almost feels like you're in a mechanic shop or something yes because the equipment is noisy and loud the energy is ramped up 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 and it's almost like you don't have time to slow things down you have to have instinctual reactions so i almost have to get myself in that place like you're describing when you're in there and you're painting before we step into the arena <laughs> where we start right. the work. Yeah. Well, and maybe for you, it happens more in the design stage. Sure. You know, when you're sitting and drawing and just like, that's when you're having all of these more atmospheric moments, you could say. Right. I completely understand I'm married to Ray, who was a metal sculptor for many years. Right. And when we first got together, I was his grinder. So when we worked together for the first, let's say, five or eight years, we had something very similar. You always had to have your wits about you. There could be something that could come crashing down on you and like crush your feet or cut your arm off. Yes. And there is a yeah, sense so of danger at all time, for sure. You have to be completely in the moment at all times. So talk to me about that relationship, because the two of you work on separate bodies of, of work. You are individual artists as a married couple, right? Right. But then are there aspects that kind of bleed over? Are there is there any kind of collaboration that happens in your overall practice in your artistry? No, th we, there's no collaboration between us, mm. but... There are aspects of running a business together, as we do. Mm. That's when our worlds merge, which is like when we're booking shows, when we're driving together, when we're setting up a booth, when we're selling. All of those things are shared in between us. Mm -hmm. But creatively, besides having a friend that can walk into your studio and make observations, that's about it. You keep those things separate. This is your world. This is what you create. And you're not necessarily looking, you know, same with, with Ray. It's it's mm -hmm. separate. You don't need that because you are your own artist. You're your own person. You're not – like I work at a collaboration where everything we do is back and forth and passing it off yes. and off. And right. some artists who are individual artists say, how can you do that? Or I wonder how long that's going to last. Well, right. it's lasted 30 years. I think it's going to it's gonna go a while. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> that's great. I – I, I respect that so much. And I think it would be fascinating to have that experience, to have this kind of like shared dream or a dream of all these shared forms that you are evolving together. I think that's beautiful. Well, the thing that for me that was a challenge at first when we decided to work this way, we were both individual artists when we met. And in school, we wanted to work as a partnership, but we were encouraged to work as individuals to develop our own aesthetic and style, which ironically, is quite different. Huh. But when we decided to launch this as our own business, we didn't want to have two booths. We didn't want to have two bodies of work. We didn't want to have her work and my work. So we came up with a style that where I did my portion, I do the layering of the glass, and she shapes and blows the form. So that mm -hmm. long-winded story was to say that when I would do my part and I'd have this vision of what I thought the piece was going to turn into, it was really hard at first to let her put her mark on it. Because, ah. or it would be hard for her if I handed it off in a way that wasn't what she was envisioning she was going to get. And on a higher level, a spiritual level, it was a really good lesson for detachment 
and allowing that third entity, the partnership, to be what made this work and not the two individuals. That's that's beautiful. It's so poetic and it's so inspiring. And what a constant challenge. When you have your defined roles, though, I honestly have gotten to the point where it's like, that's not my area, you know? Right. I mean, but we do talk later on, you know, when right. we look over the piece and say, well, what would we do different next time? We do collaborate that way, but not in the heat of the moment. Right. And when it comes to us, it's more like the logistics. Like I'm the person in the office who is like applying to shows, corresponding with clients, doing all of those things, mm-hmm. booking all of our hotels. If you look in the van, raise the person driving. This is the sure. way that we've, you know, divided our roles. And I feel like everybody's doing what they are better at. And I feel like mm-hmm. that's a constant kind of ebb and flow. Mm-hmm. Sometimes those things change. Yeah. So logistically, when you guys book a schedule, is it always, in, if you guys aren't both in the festival, do you not do it? You know what I mean? Or is it is it always you go off together? We always go together. We're always the support team. Mm. We've been challenged a few times because Ray's work is very large and my work is growing too. So there's only room basically for two booths in the van. So like mm-hmm. two booths, two walls and enough artwork to fill both of those booths. So it can be a challenge if one of us wants to have a double booth. And so that is something that we're kind of grappling with right now. Okay. Gotcha. So beyond Ray, I know that you are in kind of a creative tribe there in Greenville. Is that true? Can you tell me yes. kind of about your situation, your studio and all that? It's been one of the greatest surprises of my life. I always thought I was the solitary artist. I love my privacy. Mm. I just, you know, I love to be just away from people when I'm in my work. Mm -hmm. And we live in a neighborhood in Greenville called North Main. And we would often take these walks and pass this church. And it's a beautiful, very simple mid-century church. At the end of 2019, it went up for sale. It went up for auction. We started a conversation with our friends, uh, Signe and Gena Grushevenko, about what it would look like to purchase it together. Mm. And so we did. We closed on it at the end of 2019 and did some remodeling at the beginning of the spring of 2020. So as we were all about to leave for La Quinta, we had confirmed the presence of 10 other artists who were going to join us in this building. As, as like a collective gallery or as like tenants or what? Basically, we, we work in the building. These other artists pay us rent, mm-hmm. but we have a shared vision. It's, it is a collective of sorts. We all have different business models, but we're a constant support to each other. It's a, it's a daily support, which is wonderful. I so see. we're basically uh, 12 artists mm-hmm. and one interior designer oh. working under one roof. So we each have individual spaces and we come together to sort of open our doors and like meet the community, meet collectors. That happens about once or twice a year. Oh, okay. Right. And then, but then you also have a common name too. Right. So collectively we're known as Oye, O-Y-E. And it's the Spanish word for listen, or it's it's somewhat informal. It's it's sort of like hey you, like or getting listen. your attention, kind of a thing. Like we're here. Correct. Yeah. And and yeah. and how did that that theme or that idea come about? The twelve of us in the spring of 2020 had this big fun meeting where we spent a couple of hours mm-hmm. talking about like what word or what collection of words would represent us. Yeah. And we went through you know, Ukrainian words, because again, it's Ukrainian, sure. Spanish words, because Ray and I are Cuban, and there's actually a third Cuban artist, mm-hmm. lots of interesting conversations. And we just, I love that it just kind of came to this very simple three letters. Hmm. Well, there's an element of representation, you know, lots of different people from different cultures from whatever. And it's like, saying, hey, we're here. You know what I mean? It, you know, right. we have something to say <laughs> and, and, and we want to put ourselves out there. This is that's cool. It's true. And we're you know, we're here for each other. We're here for the community. It's been such a beautiful and positive experience. I feel like I never could have imagined that it would be so great. Coming from a place of thinking in your head 
that what you wanted was solitude. And then, Always. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and then you have this tribe that kind of just magic. I mean, it started with a partnership with the Grushevinkos buying this place. And then it expanded from there. So kind of like the snowball, you know what I mean, was growing. The idea kept taking on different components to it. Right. Yeah. And we check in with each other when we make, you know, like major decisions right now. One of our artists, Glory Day Laughlin, who is a wonderful resident of Greenville, she is working on a mural in the in the alcove to the entry of the church. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, you know, you just shine the light on the person that's able to do it and who's got like the most beautiful gift to accomplish that and just let them go at it. It's really it's really very, very inspiring. Nice. I guess we'll wrap here soon, but I wanted I wanted to ask, so this this experience that with the Camino and thinking about wanting to go back and do it again, was there anything from that experience that is seeped into your practice, your art practice? It's hard to say. I mean, day to day there is there's little aspects of a difference that I feel. I think you had mentioned earlier that you were aware that Shirley MacLaine had said, and I've read other people who have done the Camino to say the reaching of the church in Santiago, the reaching of Santiago de Compostela is only the halfway mark. The rest of the pilgrimage is really what comes after, which is yet to be determined. Mm -hmm. So it, it might be something that I think is nourishing, you know, myself and my work for the next few months or years. So I have no idea what it'll be. Mm -hmm. I do feel like I might be more interested in depicting the landscape as a subject in my work, which I never was before. Okay. But having spent so much time with it and just having appreciated it as this place where all of it unfolds even though I never have been very attracted to the landscape, I think that might be a place where I might be going. Hmm, cool. And maybe it's not so much literally pulling images from that experience, but no. it might be the the practice that you put into the connectedness every day, the reverence that you felt every day, that that does some of that creep into your daily life? Does that stay with you? Oh, absolutely. Just kind of a, a deepening of experience, a making time to have moments of reflection during the day, and definitely just remembering how much I love to walk and what a wonderful place that is for reflection and inspiration. And that's something that as artists, too, that we get that luxury because we've crafted our lives around Whatever kind of schedule we want, whatever kind of – if we need a walk or want to walk because it spurs our creativity, then we take that break and we do it. If we're done with a piece and it's time to you know, take care of our body, we do that too. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be this rigid life that other people craft for themselves and kind of like walk on this treadmill through the end. It's true. It's a it's a it's a total luxury. I will. Um, I always feel so grateful for that. It's just the the ability to craft your day to to design your life as we all do, and to go to a show or not go to a show to like create something and sell it or not sell it or destroy it. All of those things are <laughs> wonderful choices. Right. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Nobody, it's true. It's, it's nobody will ever see this. <laughs> <laughs> I've made the decision. It's done. <laughs> I've made this beautiful thing and no one will ever see it. Yeah. It's just for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything else you wanted to, to talk about or to cover here on your talk before we uh, end, our, end our episode? I hope I can be descriptive enough. I always feel like I'm a visual artist because I don't have a very good way with words, but mm. it was such a powerful experience. And I hope that you can eke out some points to express what a beautiful experience it was. Well, it came through loud and clear for me. So if it came through to me, I'm sure that many others will will also get something from that. And I love that you said that my good friend Duke Clausen is what kind of, you know, planted yeah. the seed in you because he is him and Ledez and his daughter Brenna, they are part of this art fair community for <sighs> 
I don't know, probably since the beginning. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and I love that guy. And I, yeah. I miss seeing him out on the road as much since he's kind of retired from the road. Right. And hopefully he's been walking, walking on the Camino more. Yeah. Or posting those photos yeah. of himself somewhere in the world on his head doing his headstands. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, um, I'm so grateful for all those veterans out there that have been just kind of like forging the path for us all and showing us like, this is one way of doing it. And, you know, here we come and we're all choosing how we want to go forward. Yeah. Well, this was a great talk. I really appreciate you taking time and telling me all about your experience. This was awesome. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. All right. Cool. Have a good one. Take care. You too. Thanks. Bye. Great talk with Patricia. Thank you so much for talking with her. Pretty moving talk. I enjoyed that. Totally. Totally. Um, I broke one of the rules that you told me, Will, when we started this, this, Mm. this project. I stopped recording when we said goodbye. I thought we were wrapping things up. And the oh, gold no. happened after that. It was uh, well, there was a no. lot of gold in the episode. I'm not saying there wasn't, but she is so generous and so inspiring. And she said she ended things for me with, "I would be really excited to follow your Camino journey," which I thought was, on the one hand, a beautiful sentiment, and on the other hand. I wondered if she got a signing bonus. I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready for the journey. I'm absolutely ready. Yeah, does that sound like something that'd be up your alley? Uh, it does, actually. And I've talked to uh, another artist who is has tentatively given me the go-ahead that he wants to talk. Trey Taylor, uh, talking about going on, on some of his journeys down to Peru mm. and uh, just to kind of tease later in the season. And to put the fire to his feet, uh, that, that we're actually going to talk to him. I <laughs> you think put him be... down in ink, and it and the follow through can happen a little faster. <laughs> Absolutely, I've done it before. I've done it before, and I'm excited to get that recording down and and kind of share his his journey as well. It would it would be really nice. We're sharing our set list with everyone. I'm also excited that I'll be talking to Cat Tesla down the road here too. Uh, I love her. Yeah. Well, we she's so great. Well, she's one of the ones who we bonded over our share our shared wounds, you know, with her recovering from breast cancer and me and my situation and and just how the nuances of coming in and out of our artist life, how much we share with our collectors and with the world, because being an artist, it's like we are the product. I mean, we make a product, but we are also the source of that product. So how how revealing are we in that whole journey? So that's I'm looking forward to that talk. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm really happy that uh, you're going to talk to her because that is that's one of the people that were kind of on my pencil list of, of like, oh, I wonder if Kat would talk about. But I just I think uh, their journey and Kat's husband and how supportive those two have been for each other has been really mm-hmm. lovely to watch. And, and I'm I could not be happier seeing her back on the road and totally. creating her amazing abstracts. And, and it's it's really moving to just kind of watch each other kind of go through the shit we got to go through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Hey, a little bit of business, everybody. Uh, We are going to be taking a three-week break in between the next episode instead of our usual two Schedule's a bit tight here coming up, but uh, it's just we're we're going far from home, uh, going into a busy September, hopefully. Yeah. So I uh, I appreciate you being willing to take your foot off the gas with this a little bit, and and uh, always appreciative of of Zap for sponsoring us as well. Yeah, that's right, absolutely. All right, folks, I wish you nothing but good luck out there on the road. I hope you sell out. Remember, like my good friend Matthew Nasker always said, our job is not to do shows. Right. We make if you art. can sell it, sell it now and cancel. And cancel early so somebody can jump in off the there you go. How about that? All right. Sell it all, everyone. Have a good one. We'll see you in three weeks. I'll see you soon, buddy. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is naiaartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's zapplication.org. And while you're at it, check out Will's website at willarmstrongart.com and my website at sigwithglass.com. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. 